Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, on the eve of a vote of confidence, a clash of leadership. The opposition parties have a choice. Canadians have a trust problem with this Prime Minister. What's at issue and what's at stake? I never have been this scared in my life. Airline workers demand more help. They are truly devastated by the decision. An Ottawa police officer is not guilty in the death of Abdi Rahman Abdi. Plus, the politics of masks. That mistake in messaging can sow the seeds of confusion for many people. What's behind the decision not to wear one? This is The National. So who wants to have a federal election right now? You know, in the middle of a pandemic. Well, party leaders say they don't want one. But that is what MPs will be voting on tomorrow amidst a bizarre standoff over a conservative motion. The party wants a committee formed, what it calls an anti-corruption committee, to scrutinize government spending and lobbying. But the Liberals up the ante by making it a matter of confidence in their minority government. So here's David Cochran with Act One of a parliamentary drama that could end up sending all of us to the polls. We want Parliament to work. For a Prime Minister who says he doesn't want an election, Justin Trudeau sounds a lot like a politician willing to have one. Now the opposition parties have a choice. Do they want to make Parliament work and work for Canadians, or do they want to vote non-confidence and trigger election? The choice, Mr. Speaker, is theirs. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have a trust problem with this Prime Minister. The issue is the Conservative demand for a special committee to resurrect the WE investigation and dig into other controversies involving Liberal insiders. Who and what are the Prime Minister covering up with these latest threats of an election? The Liberals want a committee to examine all pandemic spending, not just the controversies, and are making the disagreement a confidence vote. This Prime Minister has stated his willingness to plunge the nation into a pandemic election all over the procedural wrangling of a committee. Seriously. Apparently so. An election when travel restrictions would block leaders from campaigning in the Atlantic and the North. When the battleground ridings in Quebec and Ontario are COVID hotspots. The Bloc Québécois is backing the Conservatives, even if Trudeau's election threat is real. We do not fear such an opportunity because we are absolutely ready to go if need be. The NDP is trying to broker a compromise while condemning Trudeau's stance. That is outrageous and it is absurd. Let me be very clear. The only way there is an election right now is because the Prime Minister chooses to have one. Everyone insists they don't want an election and will keep talking, but right now this is headed to a confidence vote on Wednesday, one year to the day since the last election. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, now let's turn to our chief political correspondent, Rosie Barton. Rosie, uh, what is actually happening here? <laughs> well, to put it simply, the government's trying to send a message to the official opposition that it's just not going to put up with this kind of thing, that in its view, the Conservatives have gone too far, they're bullying the government instead of holding them to account. So the Liberals are challenging the Conservatives, essentially saying that if this is such an important issue, put your money where your mouth is, express your lack of confidence in the government, and let's fight an election over this. But remember, it is the government decision to make this a confidence motion it doesn't have to be. So they too are playing with fire here, choosing to up the ante this way. And they're essentially threatening an election because they don't like what the Conservatives are asking for. And that's not a great position for the government to be in either here. So the chances here, what are the chances that the government will fall tomorrow and then of course trigger an election? A couple things to remember. This is sort of how minority parliaments work. We get to this kind of brinkmanship pretty regularly. Talks continue. A compromise is reached. Everyone suddenly backs down. So that's still very possible. The parties are still talking. And the NDP in particular, which has been less definitive with its position today, has said it is looking for a solution. It will make clear its position after caucus, uh, its meeting uh, tomorrow morning. But ultimately, as David said, Everyone here is saying they don't want an election. They just really aren't acting like that right now. All right, so we may talk again tomorrow. Thank we you. might. <laughs> Thanks. And in fact, we will see Rosie tomorrow, no matter how that vote goes. That is because we're bringing you a special Wednesday night at issue.
Uh, the Trudeau government is also being criticized for how it's handling the lobster fishery dispute in Nova Scotia. Now, as Kayla Hounsell tells us, the fisheries minister says she is assigning a special representative for negotiations between Indigenous and commercial fishermen. St. Mary's Bay was choppy today, but the situation off the water remained calm. Fishermen from the Sebeganegadi First Nation continue to tend their traps. And another band, the Member 2 First Nation in Cape Breton, now says it plans to launch its own moderate livelihood fishery within weeks. We're still having discussions with the federal government. We feel that they're taking us very seriously now. They've heard it, heard it loud and clear, I think, across the country that this is a, a big issue. The Bodledek First Nation, also in Cape Breton, launched a self-regulated fishery nearly three weeks ago. There has been no outcry from commercial fishermen there. We're fighting two separate fights here. You know, we've got a different stance in our community, and um, I wish them well in their endeavors, and it's just, uh, I can't comment on theirs. In southwest Nova, commercial fishermen say they are worried about conserving lobster stocks because the Mi'kmaq are fishing out of season. Last week, two lobster pounds where Mi'kmaq fishers were storing their catch were targeted and vandalized. One was burned to the ground. Today, the owner of the other one pleaded guilty to not disclosing lobster sales to fisheries officers in the past and was ordered to pay $20,000. It comes at a time of great concern over who has the right to buy and sell lobster. We've taken this issue extremely seriously. It is important uh, that we keep Canadians protected and safe as we move forward to respect uh, and uphold uh, rights that have been long recognized uh, for Indigenous fishers. The fisheries minister says she is appointing a special representative to help negotiate. We're hoping that we progress a lot more with before the end of the week. Um, we're kind of pushing our timelines very hard. And we're hoping that um, in the next couple of weeks we have something on paper and it's, it's out there for the world to see. Chief Sachs says he is meeting with his fishermen tonight and has good news to share with them. He declined to share it with us. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Sonyaville, Nova Scotia. Let's turn to Canada's COVID-19 situation now. For weeks, the epidemic has hinged on the high number of infections emerging in central Canada, but that could be changing. New cases reported today are higher than we've seen lately in Ontario, lower in Quebec. But across western Canada, the numbers are elevated. This isn't just a one-day thing. Since the beginning of the month, average daily cases are up anywhere from 65% in B.C. to 190% in Saskatchewan. In Alberta, the average case rates have set records with a sudden surge this month to nearly 300 a day. And Alberta is facing the same bind that has bedeviled Ontario and Quebec. Do you warn and cajole or crack down harder? As Carolyn Dunn tells us, the virus isn't waiting for an answer. Unlike other parts of the country, Halloween is still very much on in Alberta. People have said that they're going to decorate a lot this year. They're going to go over the top just to celebrate um, people are really, really excited about Halloween this year. Business is up this year, she says. People are planning everything from small family parties to full-on trick-or-treating outings. That, despite Alberta's active caseload being at an all-time high. So far, the only new public health measures have been recommendations. Now, a growing chorus of experts is encouraging Alberta to follow the lead of other provinces and increase mandatory restrictions similar to Ontario. I'm very worried about not imposing restrictions and allowing the um, virus to continue unchecked. I think that it takes an emotional toll, a toll on the health and an economic toll if we don't uh, take, uh, if we don't take stronger action. In Alberta, uh, there's this emphasis on individual liberties, um, which really in the midst of a pandemic, there has to be a little bit of sacrifice. Alberta admits its growing caseload has put it into the danger zone, but it hasn't quite hit the threshold of hospitalizations and ICU cases to start adding mandatory restrictions beyond what's already in place. There's always risks and benefits. If we were to put in place mandatory measures right now, we would be putting them in place before we knew if we were able to turn that tide without the mandatory measures. Instead, Alberta will stop testing people without symptoms and known exposure to COVID-19 
to concentrate more time and resources on those most likely to be contagious. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. In Saskatchewan, it was another high number of daily infections after a record number yesterday. One single transmission event can quickly snowball into a very large impact throughout the province. Officials blame gatherings in private homes and public spaces. More than 100 cases alone have been now been linked to a single event at a Prince Albert church meeting. We're geared up. We have the capacity now to, to do upwards to 50,000 and, and people aren't coming in. Ontario's premier addressed a sudden drop in testing this week, hoping the drop in lineups was a good thing. But case rates in the province have remained steadily high, averaging around 750 a day. There was a call for help today on Parliament Hill from a group that knows COVID's brutal economic toll. 200 pilots, flight attendants and other airline workers demanded targeted aid for their sector. Ashley Burke talked with them and heard what the government had to say. A show of force on the ground from those who usually work up in the air. I never have been this scared in my life. Well, I had to find a second job and a third job. So uh, that's really, really hard just to uh, make ends meet. COVID-19 has crushed their industry and the bad news keeps coming. More root cuts and layoffs with no end in sight. Their anger is pointed at one politician, Canada's Transport Minister Mark Garneau. It's like a train wreck going towards the wall and we haven't heard anything from him. We want to know what the plan is. What are you doing? Where are you? We've been writing to you. It's been demoralizing when you think that every time something is going to be done, they're going to be coming out giving us some positive news. It's always we're waiting, we're waiting. But both Justin Trudeau and his deputy say there has been significant help. And the wage subsidy actually delivered over a billion dollars in support to Canada's major airlines. It's definitely an issue that we are looking at closely and working on. These workers want an aid package specific to the airline industry. We want uh, very uh, low cost, long, long term loans because many of our companies are about to go bankrupt. The airports are about to go bankrupt. Imagine. They're also calling on Canada to ease travel restrictions using rapid testing. Put measures in place, COVID testing in the airports, make the travel safer, not force 14 day quarantines. Nobody can go on vacation for seven days and then come back home and sit down for 14 days in their house. Please Canadian aviation. Aviation safety. Until then, they're making sure they're heard. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. And Via Rail announced its gradual return to service in Western Canada. Starting December 11th, there will be one weekly round trip between Winnipeg and Vancouver. Wearing a mask will be required at all times in stations and on board. Well, tonight there is outrage in two provinces. Two cases where police have been exonerated in the deaths of people in serious mental distress when officers moved in. We begin with the Ottawa constable who was acquitted today on three charges, manslaughter, aggravated assault, and assault with a weapon. This comes more than four years after the violent arrest and death of a Somali Canadian man. Judy Trin shows us tonight's reaction. Anger and pain fill the streets. It stops traffic. Constable Daniel Monsion's acquittal falls far short of what the victim's family and supporters consider justice. Abdurrahman Abdi didn't die on that day. He died every single moment that every single black person, an indigenous person, has died and there was no accountability. This was the scene on the day Abdurrahman Abdi died. The anguished cries of a mother as she's kept from helping her unconscious son. In July 2016, video captured Abdi's deadly ordeal. While trying to arrest him, two officers struck him with batons and kicked him. Constable Monsion punched him in the face while wearing knuckle-plated reinforced gloves. In his ruling, the judge said the Crown failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Monsion's punches killed Abdi. The judge said it was possible that Abdi suffered a cardiac arrest when his head hit the ground when the other officer knocked him down. There was no brutal beating. Uh, I think we're going to see in the actual judgment that the, uh, it was on balance. Uh, 
a blow to the pavers when he was taken down by weir that caused that nose fracture. The constable also faces an internal investigation. Monsignor has been suspended with pay for more than four years. He now plans to return to work. As for the Abdi family, they plan to sue Monsignor and the Ottawa Police Service for $1.5 million. They are uh, truly devastated by the decision. And uh, I have assured them that uh, this is far from the end of uh, our fight on behalf of the family. From the courthouse, Abdi supporters marched to the Prime Minister's office. First, they tried protests. Now, they kneel in prayer. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. The other case we're highlighting tonight is in British Columbia. Police shot and killed Barry Shantz earlier this year. Today, a review found their actions justified. Tina Lovegreen explains why. Help yourself. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Marilyn Farcourt traveled to BC from a small town in Ontario to meet and offer food to homeless people here in Abbotsford. I'm handing these out in memory of Barry Shantz. Her brother, Barry Shantz, was a well-known and outspoken advocate for homeless people. We have many very legitimate homeless people, nowhere to go. And in these parts, you know Barry? Yes, I knew Barry. Everyone remembers him. Incredibly passionate. So passionate that I saw him burst into tears like a little child one day, just talking about the whole homeless situation. I mean, this is an emotional journey I'm on. It just helped me resolve the feelings in my life. Um, my brother was an advocate, and I kind of feel like Barry needs an advocate now. These constant arrests. Shantz was struggling with mental health and PTSD. And last January, while at his partner's home in Lytton, B.C., he became suicidal and had a gun. His partner called 911 saying he had never hurt anyone but was clearly in crisis. After a six-hour standoff where he repeatedly asked police to shoot him and fired at them once, he was shot and killed. Today, B.C.'s independent police watchdog found no criminal negligence on the part of the officers. They didn't try to push the issue in any way and they used trained crisis negotiators who are trained to deal with these very issues. But they couldn't find a mental health professional in time to be there, something his sister says could have prevented his death. They had helicopters there bringing in officers and resources for that, but they didn't bring in a health professional. And um, that's a major component that they've overlooked. Do you remember Barry at all? Yes, I do. She's filed a complaint with the RCMP asking them to review their policies to help those in crisis before it cost them their life. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Abbotsford, BC. Well, tensions are high in the UK as COVID cases climb and another region is forced into lockdown. Why does this government hate Greater Manchester? Next on The National, COVID-19 strains a united kingdom. And we ask what to do about anti-maskers, why the past may provide insight on the present. There was an anti-mask uprising in 1990 during the so-called Spanish flu. And NASA's historic mission searching for answers on the surface of an asteroid. As Canadians, we should be really, be really proud of our contribution here. We're back in two. Welcome back. The U.S. Justice Department has filed a landmark antitrust lawsuit against Google. The suit claims the tech giant is violating competition law to maintain a monopoly in online search and advertising and that it stifles competition and harms customers in the process. Google calls the lawsuit deeply flawed and says people use the search engine because they choose to, not because they're forced to. As the U.S. election inches closer, authorities are once again taking steps to thwart foreign interference. And that includes online disinformation, which in 2016 was mainly blamed on Russia. But as Thomas Dagla shows us, this time around, Canadian sources are under the microscope. Old Montreal isn't where you might expect to encounter a hub of foreign disinformation. And yet... A post office box in this convenience store is listed as the mailing address for a platform that's come under international scrutiny. It's called Global Research, a website offering audiences a wide range of conspiracy theories, 
often in line with what experts consider Russian government narratives, most recently spreading confusion about COVID-19. Depicting COVID-19 as a dangerous virus. That's the basis of the fear campaign. That's Michelle Chusadovsky, the website's listed editor. Well, for more on this, um, a frequent guest on Russian state TV and a professor emeritus of economics at the University of Ottawa. Because there's a university professor behind it, it makes those narratives all the more believable and all the more dangerous. And the Russian government. Disinformation watchers like Marcus Kolga have had Chusadovsky in their sights for years. And the U.S. State Department recently singled out global research as a Kremlin-aligned proxy site, potentially reaching more than 350,000 readers per article. People who are probably consuming this content are people who already believe in conspiracy theories, who already hold some of these kind of weird Russia-aligned views. Um, that being said, I think, you know, this is still dangerous. Very active uh, efforts by the Russians to... The FBI director warned of such sites Russia as tools of malign foreign influence Russians on behalf of Russia during this election cycle. Some posts on global research were even traced back to Russia's military spy agency. They were so successful in 2016. I'm sure they'll try the same thing again in 2020. And this website is part of that effort. The retired professor wouldn't answer questions about any links to Russia, but he denied running a Kremlin-aligned disinformation site. His lawyer told us not to embark on what he called a witch hunt. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Well, overseas in Nigeria, protests against police brutality turned violent with reports of several people killed. Thousands have demonstrated for nearly two weeks in Africa's most populous country against a police unit that rights groups had for years accused of torture and murder. Officials have deployed anti-riot forces nationwide and imposed a round-the-clock curfew. More than 1,300 prisoners escaped from a jail in the Democratic Republic of Congo after armed men attacked the facility. Local officials blamed the assault on an Islamist militant group operating in the area. ISIS later claimed responsibility. In France, thousands of people marched in memory of a history teacher beheaded outside his school near Paris last week. The teacher had shown students cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. There are reports tonight that the father of one of the students had contacted the killer, a Chechen teenager, before the attack. The parent is one of 16 people now held in custody. Police shot and killed the suspect on Friday. Well, France, Italy, Spain and the UK all got hit hard by COVID-19 in Europe. Then they seemed to get a handle on it. But cases are climbing again. And as Margaret Evans tells us, in northern England, the resistance to tightening local restrictions is strong. Is the United Kingdom coming undone? It felt a bit like it today in a showdown between the British government and Greater Manchester. The mayor, Andy Burnham, accusing Westminster of forcing the city's boroughs into a stricter lockdown against their will and without enough help to get people through it. I don't believe we can proceed as a country on this basis through the pandemic by grinding communities down through punishing financial negotiations. Mancunians have been in limbo for days now as the two sides tried to agree on a price tag for lost livelihoods. I can understand where Andy Burnham's coming from because of all the local businesses around here which are suffering at the moment. We sort of knew it was coming, so it was, could be bad news for the business and the struggle, but it's good news to finally get some information, to finally know. But in the end, there was no deal, and it's exacerbated the north-south divide, critics accusing the British Prime Minister of failing in his election promise to level up the north. Tonight, Boris Johnson said the rise of COVID cases in the north left him no alternative and that there could be no special deals. What we couldn't do, uh, I hope people understand, was do a deal with Greater Manchester that really would have been uh, out of kilter with the, uh, the agreements we'd already reached with, with Merseyside and, and with Lancashire. But this was a bitter fight, and with such different messaging from national, regional and local authorities, getting people to follow the rules, if they can figure them out, might be difficult. 
Yesterday, Wales went its own way, imposing its own full-on lockdown for the next two weeks. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, the UK has announced plans to carry out human challenge trials for a COVID vaccine. It involves deliberately infecting volunteers with the virus to find out if the vaccine works. The likelihood of discovering something that will be of enormous benefit to humanity is so great that the ethical benefit of doing the study outweighs the, um, the appreciable harm that can be caused by the, by the studies. So while these studies don't replace conventional trials, they can help find the most effective vaccines. The aim is to start human trials in January. When we come back, as anti-mask protests flare, how do we handle it? How do we explain it? There's a, a group which we're calling it's a, a kind of a COVID disregard syndrome. We look at the anti-mask movement of 1919 and its lessons for right now. And later, just two weeks before the U.S. presidential election, the fierce battle for a group of voters who could make all the difference. Welcome back. We all know there is so much to be infuriated about in this pandemic. The stubborn surges in the COVID numbers and the stubborn surges in the antics of anti-maskers, both so hard to stop, not just here, but around the world. And before you presume the pushback against masks is one more unique oddity of 2020, well, history has a few thoughts for you. Canada has no immunity to this. And as the pandemic persists, those opposing masks seem to get a bit louder, a bit more aggressive, and certainly statistically a bit more partisan. But the picture is still that Canada is a place where faith in public health is high and mask wearing is the norm. It was in the summer, at least for some 83% of Canadians. Not so for our neighbours to the south, where the summer occasional mask wearing was the norm for just 68%. The CDC is advising the use of non-medical cloth face covering as an additional voluntary public health measure. So it's voluntary, you don't have to do it. I don't think I'm going to be doing it. Please wear your masks. And when he didn't, they didn't. Listen to the crowd booing at a New Hampshire rally after being told public health rules dictate they put on masks. To observe American political rallies from afar is to presume the act of wearing a mask is akin to declaring who you're voting for. And that's a surprise to those who thought they had a handle on how the world might respond to a pandemic. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging Scientists from at Johns Hopkins like ran a simulation on a fictional pneumonia. coronavirus last the fall, before COVID came calling. They envisioned deaths of the vulnerable, pain for service industries and airlines, almost everything we've all encountered. Dr. Eric Toner led the simulation. Did you anticipate or build in the idea that public health measures would be deemed political? No. No. We did not anticipate that, and I would have thought they would be off base. It is so tempting to see what's happening now as a uniquely 2020 thing. Think of it. A president sick with a virus that's killing hundreds of thousands of people, his doctors evasive on the facts of his case, his administration downplaying health measures while an anti-mask movement is underway. But all of those things have happened before, more than a century ago, when this man, Woodrow Wilson, was the president who got that feared virus. To know that history has repeated so precisely is jarring. Everything old is new again. There was an anti-mask uprising in 1990 during the so-called Spanish flu. And the reasons they were voicing then were the same as the reasons now. They said, well, they didn't think masks worked and they thought it was a violation of their civil liberties. Then, as masks became mandatory in the worst hit places in the U.S. and parts of Canada, anti-mask protests emerged. A detail that initially astonished Canadian researcher Stephen Taylor, who wrote about the psychology of pandemics last year. He sees a lot of parallels. We've seen the rise of racism, the anticipatory anxiety, the stockpiling, um, the anti-vax attitudes, fake news, conspiracy theories, rumors, all of those things have been seen before. Hush, 
So why the need to enforce masks then and now? Why the hesitation to wear them? Taylor thinks the psychological drivers may not have changed much in 100 years. Not just those who think the virus won't affect them, but those who take it further. There's a, a group to which we're calling it's a, a kind of a COVID disregard syndrome. When someone tries to encroach upon their freedoms, they, they react in, in, in almost a very strong pushback. And the people who have this reactance tend to be anti-maskers, they're anti-vax, and they want to open up the economy. They don't want to engage in social distancing. They also tend to be politically conservative as well. This is consistent with the makeup of anti-masker crowds in places like Quebec. Those rallies often peppered with signs promoting anti-vaccine messaging and conspiracy theories. But it seems there's more to anti-masker protests than that. Confusing signals from leaders can do real damage to public confidence. Early on, we were told by the WHO, by health authorities, do not wear a mask, you do not need to wear a mask, save the masks for the healthcare workers. And we got that message for many months and then suddenly there was a, a, a complete 180 degree shift and we we're told we have to wear masks. So that mistake in messaging can sow the seeds of confusion for many people. So how do you course correct, especially when vaccines become available and doubts rise anew? Again, look back. The mask rebellion of 1919 ultimately fizzled out, not just because there was no social media to spread it, but because an overwhelming number of people became sick. It was personal. Public health campaigns became louder, more insistent. Keep that up is the advice. So in your scenario, how did you overcome misinformation from governments and public distrust? Well, what the participants said they used an American football analogy, which is you need to flood the zone. You need to have everybody, public health authorities, elected officials, um, everybody just flooding the, the airwaves with the accurate information. Mocking and shaming aren't advised. It may only make people dig in, but some countries feel they have few options. In Indonesia, those who refuse to wear masks are being ordered to dig graves for COVID patients. Sometimes get in the graves and just lie there for a while. An Italian legislator was physically removed by colleagues for refusing to wear a mask. COVID-19 In India, you cannot make a phone call without hearing a recorded voice urging mask wearing. The voice actor now a bit of a star. The voice of this message has become a little irritating. Definitely annoying, but the message sticks. As carefully as statisticians collect COVID case numbers, pollsters gauge attitudes, especially in the US. And for the briefest of moments a few weeks ago, they saw a flash of togetherness. An increase in Democrats and Republicans claiming to take the virus seriously and to consider more mask use. That happened when the president was diagnosed and all those masks started showing up at the White House. Modeling matters. But that was then. Four more years! Four more years! The president has since recovered, and as the gloves come off in the election run-up, so do his masks, and the worry is, so do theirs. It, re it really is sobering, though, right? I mean, to think of how many things can go wrong, how, mm -hmm. how there are infinitely more ways for a message to get off track than there are to, to keep it on the rails. And also, what, what we really need to learn from looking back, I mean, what the history clearly tells us is that the Spanish flu got almost free reign in large part because of the, the inactivity of, of politicians. So the downplaying of the seriousness of it, the accusations that talking about the virus was somehow unpatriotic. And, and you know, that's as clear a lesson as history can give on, on why the truth is a matter of life and death. Lesson learned. Uh, okay, next on The National, the fight to win over a crucial group of U.S. voters. Remember, elections in Florida are generally won by under 2%. We're on the ground in the Sunshine State as both sides try to sway the Latino vote. Joe Biden nos permitiría arreglar los daños que Trump ya ha hecho en este país. I'm Joe Biden. And I approve this message. Joe Biden's campaign released several Spanish language ads today with somber calls for change. Today's ad from Donald Trump's campaign struck a different tone.
They're battling to win over what may be a critical demographic. Latino voters could sway the election in several states. And as Susan Ormiston tells us from Florida, one of the most important swing states of all, neither side can afford to take those votes for granted. Just moments to live from a tiny Miami studio. Meet YouTube sensation Alex Otola, priming his daily show. Hola, hola. A mix of Latino music, opinion, and politics. Here he mocks Biden, who said recently he was running for the Senate. And then he glorifies Trump at a Florida rally. Look at this image he's saying. Are you connected with the Trump campaign? Yes. How? Uh, they called me for, uh, you know, the news. Uh, that's it. Do they tell you what to say? No, <laughs> nobody. Nobody can say me what I say. Nobody in the world. I'm free person. He claims more Latino votes are shifting towards Trump, convinced that Democrats are next to communists. You think Joe Biden is a communist? I think Joe Biden have relation with the left. Yes. But he says he's not a socialist. He said that. Fidel Castro, Castro said, I'm not a communist. Then one day, he was a Marxist-Leninist. Cuban Beats, the soundtrack for an intense political play. The race in Florida is so tight and the state so crucial. Latino votes have power. We are so within the margin of error that, uh, you know, just a small shift of the Cuban vote, or Nicaraguan, right, or Puerto Rican, could determine the outcome. Remember, elections in Florida are generally won by under 2%. In the bars and cafes of Little Havana, Trump appeals, playing up his role as the bulwark against socialism and communism, a strong man versus a weak old man. He appeals extraordinarily well to this idea that only he can liberate Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua because he is the, the blonde caudillo. Four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. It will always be que viva Cuba libre. Trump's team has blanketed Florida. Polls show Democrats have majority Latino support, but Republicans are gaining. A worrying sign for Biden and Kamala Harris. I'm calling her que mala, because que mala means in Spanish, how bad. She's the bad. But what's bad about Kamala? Kamala? Because it's Kamala, she's horrible. She is socialist. She is communist. The fear mongering and the social labeling has worked. Evelyn Perez Verdea is a Colombian American for Biden. This is another one. Helping fight off a virulent disinformation for campaign, for which uses tools like Facebook and WhatsApp aimed at Latinos. It's Hillary Clinton. Oh and they gosh. show her as um, almost like Satan. And then they show President Trump running with two babies. Las or this grupo, video suggesting a militia eh, will panitado, march for Trump. Eh, That's the message to the Latinos. These militiamen are helping Unidos us against the communists that you see on the streets. Sociales. There's a big connection also to say, you know what, you escaped violent countries. Now, if you don't vote for Donald Trump, they are, you're, they're going to come to you, they're going to come to your house, and they're going to destroy you. Let's go, Joe! With just two weeks to go, a fierce standoff between Biden's activists and Trump's supporters. We love President Trump! With Latino votes in play. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Miami. Next, NASA makes space history on the surface of an asteroid. If you're able to collect a sample from an asteroid, ultimately what you've done is gone back in time by four and a half billion years. NASA collects a small sample in hopes of answering some big questions. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, a showdown in Ottawa means Canadians are facing the specter of a possible snap federal election. We'll talk about how we got here. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 
Sergey, it's with great pleasure and honor that I present you this key and command of the International Space Station. Congratulations. Well, there you go. That was the change of command ceremony on board the space station today. Russia's Sergei Rizikov took over from NASA's Chris Cassidy, who will return home along with two Russian cosmonauts. The three wrapped up their six-month mission, which spanned more than 130 million kilometers around the Earth. And now to a different feat of space exploration far beyond the International Space Station. But after a four-year, 332 million kilometer journey, this visit lasted just seconds. And that was precisely the plan for a NASA spacecraft's trip to an asteroid made possible by some Canadian technology. Aaron Saltzman tells us how and why this happened. There it is, Bennu, a diamond-shaped chunk of rock and dust and who knows what else. Well, soon we could actually have a pretty good idea. We're actually going to collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. Three, two, one. If only it were that simple. And liftoff of OSIRIS-REx. NASA's OSIRIS-REx left Earth four years ago. Its first trick traveling more than 330 million kilometers to catch up with an incredibly dark asteroid barely 500 meters in diameter. Then matching Bennu's orbit and rotation as it hurtles around the sun at 100,000 kilometers per hour. Get it right and they could literally pick up clues to understanding the formation of our solar system. If you're able to collect a sample from an asteroid, Ultimately, what you've done is gone back in time by four and a half billion years to understand what the raw ingredients of the solar system are. In order to collect a sample, they needed a flat spot at least 50 meters across, covered in fine-grained material, or sand, basically. Instead, we saw these mountains, we saw boulders, we saw rocks. And that is where Canada comes in. The Canadian-built and designed OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter took about three billion measurements, creating a hyper-accurate 3D model of Bennu. As Canadians, we should be really, be really proud of our contribution here because this Canadian technology has really done something that, that has never been done before. Armed with the most detailed map in the history of space exploration, OSIRIS-REx could ease slowly down to a small spot on the surface, extend its sample collector, and vacuum up a few grams of Bennu. So we've got one more firing of thrusters. Tonight, the moment of truth. Touchdown declared. Sampling is in progress. All right. All right. It could be a week before they can tell if they have a viable sample, but for space exploration, it's already a win. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, next on The National, a delivery service in the time of COVID. The story behind why this one is so special in our moment. Next. Pauline and Albert Krauss are trying to help people from Nunavut who have to travel to Winnipeg for appointments, then isolate for 14 days before they can return home. Now, to make that period of time a little easier, Pauline and Albert offer a very special delivery service. And the story behind it is our moment. Me and my husband, I think, are the first ones to start something like this. Essential service for Inuit that come down here. The pandemic going on now, we're doing delivery and essential shopping stuff for people that are isolating at the hotel. We run pretty much every day, morning till night. My first language is in Tutut. I grew up in Nunavut my whole life. That's the first language I'm gonna speak to them. Every time I speak to them, I really feel at home because it is my first language and I really enjoy speaking it to them. We're very passionate of what we do here. I could say it's about the money, but it's really not. It's really about being there for them, just to be safe down here and get back home safe. That's the whole meaning of our business. Well, that's really amazing. And, and you know, maybe, maybe thoughtfulness is, is the universal language, but the fact that they literally speak the language, right? Imagine flying all that way, how warm and welcoming that must feel. That's uh, it's important. And, and Pauline told our producer, Liza, that everyone who's from the region where she's from knows her. So she's from uh, Well Cove with a population <laughs> mm. about 500, and she said instantly the stress is relieved a bit, mm. which is something you definitely need in that moment. <laughs> that is a national for October 20th. Good night. Good night.